This past summer, I was able to take my family um, with, with uh, my stepbrother. We, we went out on Lake Hartwell in Georgia, where I grew up, and I was able to take them to this cliff that I wanted to, to, to go jump off of, and I, I didn't think that they would do it or didn't really want them to do it, but I, I wanted to do it. I wanted to go jump off this cliff into the, into the Lake Hartwell because I, I, I kind of needed to redeem myself. Uh, I needed I needed to uh, I needed to I needed to do this. And when when my stepbrother said, "Hey, do you want to go give that a shot?" I was like, "Yeah, I want to go do it. I want to go do it." But as I was swimming up to it, um, I had this thought come to mind. It was the last time that I attempted to jump off that cliff. I was in middle school, and my brother and I had. Um, gone there on the back of like a sea do like a two-person kind of sea do and it was like I don't know a good 35 or 40 minutes from the boat ramp that we launched from and we go and as I was climbing up the cliff it's kind of like kind of a cliff with some mud and some dirt and it gets really muddy once you get it wet you know and then you kind of got it some more rock and it goes up but there's typically there's a rope hanging down and once you kind of get up there you hold on to the rope and you got to kind of swing over to one side and then you keep holding the rope and you get up into the dirt which is really slick and there's some roots and stuff but you got to keep holding on to the rope and I got up to that rope part and I'm, I'm holding on with my, my, my well both both hands but I'm, I'm holding on to it and I get stung on my head by a yellow jacket and I take and I smack myself in the head, and when I do, I just realize I'm getting pounded by yellow jackets, not one, but a bunch. I mean, they're just pounding my head. And so I just hold onto the rope with one hand, and I swat the yellow jackets with the other. And my brother goes, jump! And I don't know why I didn't think of that. Like, in the moment, I don't know why I thought, hey, let me just swat at him with one hand on the side of a cliff rather than just jump. And so when he said that, I just kind of turned and with one motion jumped in the water um my head swole up i had a, i mean i mean it swallowed i mean it was bad i got on the back of that that uh uh sea do and we took off back to the boat ramp we went through a thunderstorm i mean it was it was awful it was a horrible experience but i went home and like took all the benadryl and and went to went to bed and so i was glad this summer to have that moment of redemption to climb it I did it like a boss, didn't I, boys? Weren't y'all proud? Y'all are like, my dad's not scared of anything. Um, as people were up there, like, hyperventilating, wanting to jump off of it. And, and uh, anyway, ha, ha, ha. Um, here's what I want to tell you. Last, last week, I kind of started this sermon, my sermon with an analogy that so often we address the bee sting rather than the bee hop. And... You know, I, I wanted to sit, sit down, I feel, as a shepherd in our church, as I, I lead our people, I feel like we really need to um, address this cultural uh, construct, this cultural uh, moment of gender identity and general dysphoria. And, and what I began when I, stu- when I was studying, I realized, like, okay, this bee sting, there's, there, it, there's a greater problem, there's a beehive, and that beehive is that we don't, we have this identity issue. And we do not understand that we're created in the image of God. Right? That's, that's the issue. But I also at the same time am saying, okay, that's the issue. There is a beehive. I, I want you to know that in this moment, there's a whole lot of bee stings. There's a whole lot of bee stings that come from gender identity. And it's not like, oh, it's an occasional bee sting. It is like we're on the side of that cliff and we are getting hammered in the head by, by bee stings. And, and all I can tell you today, to, to do today is to jump into the Bible. Jump. Don't. This is not the time to go, okay, I think let's hear what culture has to say. This is the time where I, we need to go, let's listen what the word has to say. Let's listen to what truth has to say, not lies. And so let's jump into the Bible this morning. Here is the big truth that I want to share with you in, in this Is a big truth that comes from Scripture. We always want them to. And here it is. You are fearfully and wonderfully made body and soul. You are fearfully and wonderfully made body and soul. Last week, we read in Genesis chapter 1, 
in, in the first account of creation. And two, there, chapter two of Genesis, there's, there's a second account of creation. And we want to we wanna read there today. So go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter two. And we're going to read verses five through seven. That's where we're going to start. Moses, who um, was the human author of the book of Genesis, inspired by the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit revealed to him, the creation account gives him this. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord formed the man of dust from the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So one of the first things that I would, I would point out to you is that the Lord had cause in creation. We see that in verse 5. We see, for God had not caused it to rain. We see, when we read the whole creation account, we see that when God spoke it into being, he had cause. There was intentionality. There was in intelligence in his design. There was meaning and purpose in why he was doing what he was doing. The next thing I would show you is that the Lord God formed the man from the dust, from the ground, and breathed life into his nostrils. God had cause in what he was doing, um, but he also specialized in human creation. Right? That's, that's, that's a beauty that we see that he uh, treated us differently than he did the rest of creation. That that when we, we look at creation, we look at what we read last week. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That he, he in, in his causes, put special effort. He did what for, for man, what he didn't do for any of the other living creatures. And then there, here's the, the next thing that I would show you is that they became a living creature. You're like, yeah, Zach, we are living creatures. You're right, we are. But just to, just to harp on this, your dog's not home thinking about how it was created, right? Well, there's a created order. I, uh, I, got an, I got a very beautifully written card uh, uh, sitting up here on the front this morning, and in it there was, a, there was, a, there was somewhat of um, a defense that, hey, there, Tracy Winey's dog Frank is smart too, all right? Um, he is smart. I'm sure Frank is a smart dog, but Frank, just like Allie, is not home thinking about why they're created. They're just wondering if the prime man's going to put a package at the door so they can bark at them, right? There's a created order. God gave us dominion over it. We see over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps, God gave us dominion. We are the living creature that he gave dominion and authority to. I want you to see something else. I want you to turn to Psalm chapter 139, verses 13 through 16. And I, I had Jed read this. I struggled with, with what I was going to have him read out of this passage because I wanted us to pick up on the fact that, that, that the Lord has searched me and he knows me and that the Lord is our creator, the Lord is our sustainer. Um, he knows me before I know myself. It, verse 5 says, he hems me in behind and before me. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful me. It is it's so high I cannot attain. So he's saying like in, in the hemming, in the making of me, and in, 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 in the putting the, the human together and stitching us together in our, our mother's womb. Like it is too much for us to truly understand and contain the incitement and joy that the Lord did that for us. And, and that we're special. Let's, let's go to verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret. Intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance in your 
book were written, every one of them, the days were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. And so we see again that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. But I want you to pick up on something here. If you look at my big truth, go th- throw my big truth back up there. I said, you are fearfully and wonderfully made, body and soul. Pick up on this. For you form my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. We see, actually, in Scripture, over and over, this next big idea is that you have a body and a soul. You have a body and a soul. Another place that we can clearly see this is Deuteronomy chapter 6. Moses again writing, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And so your heart, your, your body, your soul... Your might, and your might is the two combined. It's both things. Jesus, Jesus changed it up a little bit when he quoted it in Matthew. He says, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And again, there, mind, might, the, the totality of who you are. Okay? The totality, the totality of who you are. You have a body and a soul. And that matters. I'm going to talk a lot about why that matters. But I'm going to talk about why the, the world struggles with this idea that the body has more than one part, an outward self and an inner self. And so psychology today would tell you that there's an outward self and an inner self. The, the world is chasing after this idea, this idea of the outward self and the inner self. They're chasing after it, but, it, but again, it, it's like the person who can diagnose Man, my car's, my car's going thunk, 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 thunk when I drive it, but I don't know what's wrong with it. I think I'll just keep driving it. Ross, that's a bad idea, isn't it? Ross will tell you, Ross, Ross owns Fort Collins 4x4. If you've got something wrong with your car, go see Ross. But if it's going thunk, 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 stop driving it. Okay? I can diagnose that, but I, ne- I can't necessarily tell you what the problem is. The world can diagnose it. Okay, there's an inner self, there's an outer self, there's something that we're wrestling with. Um, the, the world, as they start talking about inner self, um, it's, it, it, they, they, here's what they kind of come up with. It's what, what, about, it's what can't be seen. It's our feelings, our intuition, our values, beliefs. It's our, our personality. It's our, our, our thoughts, emotions, fantasies, desire, also known as our Enneagram number, right? So... It's like, okay, here's our inner self, and it can be, our inner self can be put in one of nine categories. Or, you know, maybe, maybe it's the disc profile. It's one of four. Here's your personality type. We, we struggle with inner self. Um, we, so, so often, we kind of think in terms of self-help. Uh, the, the world is self-help, the, the pursuit of self in a lot of our culture today being one's true self, being true to oneself, is the highest uh, level of moralism for a person. That, that you be you, you be the true you, is what we're kind of searching for. A matter of fact, of, of, of um, books written in America, nearly two-thirds of books written in America today are trying to help people discover their selves, their their inner selves. You'll see uh, people talk about things of like state of consciousness, our level of awareness of internal events and external surroundings, and and we try to uh, achieve uh, this peace with our inner self and a state of consciousness. Now, I, I say that, man, I want to show you where you can you can find this from Old Town to, to podcast to wherever you go in culture, is that so much of... Um, Part of, uh, of our culture in Fort Collins that kind of centers around not yoga. And when I say yoga, I don't, I don't mean stretching, right? I mean 
My, my, my 92-year-old grandmother, man, she was laid up in her 80s. She was still, she was still doing her stretching, which would, looked a whole lot like yoga to me, but she would not call it yoga, right? But she was healthy and flexible, right? But she wasn't, she wasn't going and trying to find her zen and, and, and trying to, to balance out. She wasn't using Eastern religions and Buddhism mixed in with um, uh, American culture to kind of weave together to make peace with what was going on inside of her. That's what we do. I mean, um, you can say, well, it's, it's, we're just doing yoga this or yoga that. But if you, I just tell you this, if you go to, if you go to Old Town, if you go to Comet Chicken, any, anybody like Comet Chicken? Okay, if you don't like Comet Chicken, there's a, there's a better place, just a few doors down. Al's Burgers, right? Big Al's, right? Both of those are good, in my opinion. I don't turn down either one of them. But right behind that, do you know that there, there's, there, there are Buddhists there that are, that are teaching you yoga, teaching you to find your Zen, to, to, to deal with your inner self? And so you get, get it laced all throughout our culture around us. Now, some of you are like, well, I've never done yoga. Okay, well, good. But you've listened to Joe Rogan's podcast. And, man, there's Joe Rogan trying to make peace with him, inner, his inner self over and over and over. And you know how we can do it? Here's how Joe Rogan has come up to make peace with it. LSD. Let's just do drugs and, and figure out how to use some sort of substance to find, like, this is going on an LSD trip. Um, I listened, uh, listened to a book at a recommendation of somebody not too long ago by an actor who, I'm not even going to tell you because I want you to listen to the book. I'm not going to tell you who the actor is. But an actor who many of us, like if, if I said one of his sayings or slogans, you'd know it. You'd know what state he was from. You'd know what football team he pulls for. You'd know all the things about it. And at the end of the day, like how does he find inner peace? Drugs, right? That's how he deals with his mess. And so... This is so much uh, of going on around us that we are trying to deal with not just what's on the outside, but what's on the inside. And one of the things this has caused us to do, nothing's new under the sun, by the way, is to try to separate the outside and the inside. We, we want to be able to look in the mirror and go, that's not who you really are. You're different than that. You're different than, than, than what you see. So here's the next thing I want to show you. The next big idea is that you are your body. You are your body. Your inner self and your outer self, to use psychology's term, your, to use biblical terminology, your body and your, your soul are one. They are together. Okay? Now, we're going to talk about this because they're also separate, but they're also one. While you're on this earth, your soul is not disconnected from this body. You are your body. In um, this pursuit of the inner self and the detachment of the two, one of the ways in which we got to where we are today to think that we can uh, detach the two things is actually uh, goes back to the 1960s and the sexual revolution. In the sexual revolution, we tried to separate sex and make it merely physical and not something that was connected to the inner self. And so that is what, we, no, there's, there's nothing, there, you know, it's just physical. That's all it is. And so... Um, Couple, couples would try to justify affairs or fornication, different forms of adultery to say, hey, this is only physical, this isn't more. This is the body doing that, not really me. This is physical, this is not emotional, we, we, people would often, often say, right? And so, here's what I want to show you, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul says this in, in chapter 12. I'm going to read more because I think there's some context that, that once kind of we unpack it a little bit will help this make, make sense. Starting in verse 12, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body's not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. 
And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits. And this is where I want you to, to really tune in. To this is part of the point that I'm making here. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. So meaning, uh, there's, there's sins that, that we sin against other people. But within sexual immorality, we sin against our own bodies as well. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a prize, so glorify God in your body. And so, here's, here's what I want to show you. When you look at verse 12, you'll see quotes there. All things are lawful for me. So, as Paul is writing this, he, he's writing something that, that's appealing to his audience in Corinth. Right? So in Corinth, there was a saying that said, all things were lawful for me as they tried to justify actions. And so, again, you'll see food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And so he's quoting something that they say. Now, in Greek life, um, there were some, some, some thought processes. Uh, if you start talking about Gnosticism and Greek life and all those things where... There's this sep separate, like my, my body and my spirit, my body, my soul, my body, and my inner self, as we would determine, are, are different. And one doesn't pay the consequence for the other. And so I can do this thing with my body, and I can get away with it in, in my soul or my spirit. And so that, that's the, that was the thinking of the day. Remember, I told you nothing is new under the sun. And so here we try to do this again. We try to separate the outer self and the inner self. And he basically goes and says, no, you can't do it. And in regards to sexual immorality, uh, sex, sex in God's creation of it, this beautiful design and gift that he gives us, connects the husband and the wife, connects the man and the woman. It is meant for a man and a woman in the context of marriage, and you cannot separate the two. And so... When, a, when the two become one flesh, when the couple is married, their bodies are each other, that they become one family unit. Spiritually, though, we become one with Christ. In a to total different, different set of circumstances, um, you, you become one with Christ. You, you, I mean, Paul uses some, some, in other places, uses some very strong language about those who, who would be with a prostitute, those who would have sex outside of marriage and what that is doing with the body of Christ. And, and, and man, Paul uses the word body to talk about the body of the church, but here he's obviously talking about the human body. Here's what I want you to understand. Your body and soul are connected. You cannot separate them. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, both of those things, body and soul. And one of the things that we had to deal with last week is that, man, we are created in the image of God, in his likeness, but we are also broken by sin. And so what we have to do is we have to deal with the fact that our bodies are, in fact, broken by sin, marred by sin at the same time. Our souls are broken by sin, our, our inner self, if you will. But they're also fearfully and wonderfully made. They're also beautifully created by God, but marred by sin. So now, if we want to start addressing a, the, the, the bee sting. Remember, I said there's a whole bunch of bee stings, but man, this bee sting that I feel like in this cultural moment that we have to deal with is that of our gender identity. And remember, so last week I kind of laid that out for us and and said, okay, um, the, the world today is saying you have a biological sex, the sex that you were born with, you're either male or female. But then 
uh, there's this thing called gender fluidity and that your gender can change on the inside. So that's your feelings or emotion. That's your inner, inner self. And so people have kind of addressed these things. Some people have said, well, maybe God gave me a, you know, a body of one gender and a brain of a different gender. That's a, a, a way that, that a lot of people think of it. Others, others think, okay, it, it changes. It changes versus my, my, my feelings. And so, you know, I'm, I'm this way some days and I'm, I'm this way uh, uh, another day. I, I want you to understand that this is, is not a result of your body being fearfully and wonderfully made. This is a result of the fall. It's the result of the brokenness of your body. Just like when uh, someone has a heart attack that is in the physical, right, uh, that is in the body, this is also something that, that exists within your soul, a struggle of your soul. I'm going to talk a, a, a lot next week about nature versus nurture, kind of this classical kind of, kind of comparison and what those two things are. Um, spoiler alert, you know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big, like, okay, it's nurture that causes us to get here. Our sin nature allows us to be nurtured into all sorts of other, other things. What I, what, what I want to show you is that your, your body, your soul, your mind are together. They are one. They are not two different things. They are not separate things. God did not make a mistake in doing it. God, when he was building you in your mother's womb, didn't like, ah, oh, well, I made a mistake. I put the wrong brain in that one. Uh, oh, well, I was just going with it. Uh, it's not, not, how it, not how it happened. Um, there, there's, there's, there's a ton of research, there's a ton of psychology, um, papers, ton of work being, being written about this. They're talking all sorts of things. Um, in our world, it's like pretty, pretty popular to throw the dart at you to just trust science. Um, I will tell you, this is not science that you can trust. Uh, you, science is... is uh, psychology isn't an exact science, though I would say it is a, a, a form of social science. It's, it's, it changes. What's thought to be true changes. And what's true right now, 10 years, from, t t 10 years ago, what's true today, 10 years ago, if you'd, have told, if you'd have told the average psychologist, he said, no way. No way. When you think about the, the things in our culture that have changed, even, even since... Um, making homosexual marriage legal. Think about the, the difference in all the things that have changed since that moment in, within our, our um, psychology and our social sciences. They've, they've changed. And so this isn't, this isn't, oh, trust science. I read a lot this week. I read a lot of stuff that is way over my head. Um, I should have called Josiah Ziegler. He's like the only person in our church I know who could probably help me interpret that. But this is what I walked away with. Psychology is over and over trying to go to science and brain scans and in medicine uh, to try to prove a point, and they keep falling short. They, 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 they can't do it. I, w one author said this, there are virtually no grounds for creative but misplaced being problem to feature within a hard materialism because the notion of inner and real misgendered self remains vague and ill-defined under its terms. That's someone who's wanting to, to prove the point and can't. They're wanting to back up what culture is saying with science and they can't do it. And they can't do it because you and your, your body, they're not that you, you can't separate them. Uh, uh, a dysphoria that that we have it's this it's 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 a, that we're going okay here's the dysphoria somebody has i, I saw a um a video of a, 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 a was a harvard yale ivy league school professor explaining gender this week and and in it she she even says that that in the womb that babies can know that their gender is misplaced and I'm like, I, thought, I didn't think that. I thought that was a clump of cells. Not really, I didn't think that. I thought that they were fearfully and wonderfully made as a human. But they go and they talk about it and you hear it. And it's like Romans 1 coming to life. 
that claiming to be wise, they became fools. That their, their, their hearts and minds were darkened in their, their thinking and they didn't understand. In, 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 in watching those videos and reading stuff, what, what I see over and over and over is that there is this one, uh, this, 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 this misidentity, not understanding that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. I, I see, I, I don't know, maybe this is just me, but I drive around the city and I, I, notice, I notice everything. I see stuff, I notice people. I, I, I notice people all the time. And, and, like, I could tell you that on my, my morning routine and taking the boys to school, I see a lot of the same trucks, same cars, same stickers. Like, I can almost guess where people work. There's just one young lady that I see, and I see her every day walk into the bus stop, and I have great compassion for her. I don't know her. I, I, I'm not, no, I don't want to speak ill of her, but... What is clear to me is that she su suffers with anorexia. She's incredibly frail and skinny. And I can just tell by the way that she dresses, and I think it, it just, she struggles with an eating disorder. She doesn't eat. And I, I look at her, and I look at her with compassion, because why doesn't she, why doesn't she eat? Well, people who suffer with anorexia, there's a general lie they believe. They believe they're fat. They believe they're overweight. And man, I'll talk a lot about why we believe that and why anorexia didn't exist before the camera and like why the camera and why, why since the camera and social media, does that only increase and why is it, you know, we're gonna we'll talk about that stuff later. But there's a lie that she's believing, right? She's believing that, that she is overweight, therefore that causes her either to not eat or to be bulimic. There's a lie. But if you, if you go... Like, we would all clearly look at her and say, she's not, she's not overweight. You're underweight. You, you need to start eating. You don't need to stop eating. But she looks in the mirror and she sees something different. She feels something different on the inside. Man, this goes back to a lot of the beast things. We, we often do this. We do this in different ways to different degrees. I mean, there's, there's a lot of days that people in this room... You look in the mirror and you go, man, I look like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Or you'll eat and you'll feel bloated and you'll look in the mirror and you're like, man, I feel like a busted can of biscuits. And, and you're not, you know, you're, you're, you're not. Now, I'm not saying that everybody's not. I'm saying that a lot of times people who feel that aren't, right? Some of you, you feel that. You feel something that you're not. You're letting, you're letting the feelings, the inner self, determine something that's not a reality about what's on the outside of your body. And this is what happens with gender dysphoria. You have a feeling on the inside. It's nurtured often by, by something that happened, a traumatic a, a event, uh, something a parent uh, said, or so, some other, uh, uh, the, the, you know, there's a huge, huge statistic here that would show that, that most people who struggle with gender dysphoria don't have a father in the home. There's not a male present in, in their life, right? There's these outside circumstances that have caused you to believe a lie. But here's the difference. We don't look at the anorexic person in our culture and go, well, it's okay. You just be that way. Doctors look at there and say, you have anorexia, and here's the solution to anorexia. You need to eat. You don't need to believe this. But we, we, we look at the person who's struggling with gender dysphoria, and we go, Actually, you need to take puberty, puberty blockers. You need to stop the hormones in your body, or you need to have this surgery. You need to change the way that you look. And if you do those, you will be happy. Now, I don't know if you saw what happened with Vanderbilt Hospital. But Vanderbilt Hospital was performing, doing uh, life-altering, undoable surgeries on kids 13 to 18 years old. And it became, it, the, 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 this video got re released, the reason they were doing it was, guess what? It's profitable. It makes them a lot of money. And so, it's not just a cultural moment that we're tied up into, it's also a profitable moment that we're tied up into. It's a lie of Satan. It's wrong. It's, it, it, it's wrong. We must reject it. You are your body. 
And if you were born a biological male, you're male. You're a boy. So be a man. And if you were born with bio biologically a female, you are a female. You are a girl. You will be a woman. Now, we talked about last week of, of cultural gender norms. We'll talk about that. You know, we, 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 our, our culture gets it all wrong with, it, with what, what's, what's a man and what's a woman and what does a man do and what does a woman do. Th those, are, those are issues of nurture, right, so, so often culturally. You are your body, but you are also more than your body. Here's the next big idea. You are more than your body. Jesus said this, Do not fear those who will kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy, destroy both soul and body in hell. 1 Samuel, when the Lord was looking at David, Samuel was looking through the eyes of man. He was looking at the body. He was looking at the outward appearance. He was going, okay, here, here are the guys who could... Who could possibly fight the Goliath and the Philistines? And, and what does the Lord say to him? Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees, but man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so here we see that, yes, we are connected to our bodies. We are, um, we are certainly more than our bodies, but we are not less than our bodies. Our bodies are part of our physical reality. Um, our bodies will be a return, eternal reality. Our resurrected bodies will when Christ resurrects our bodies. Now, that's, that, that's kind of getting into the, 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 the future and, and how Christ will raise our bodies. But what I want to focus on is like, our, no, our bodies will, will be one day reunited soul and body. When we die, though, our soul will go and be with Jesus or our soul will go to hell. Now this this is this is really part of what makes uh, makes this is a central idea of Christianity that that inner self that inner you thinking the part that you think you can separate from your body it will it will in fact separate at death that it, that it will that we we are souls that God created are eternal that they will they will last for forever and there is then a consequence of how we live our life that we should love the Lord our God with all of our body and our soul with all of our might with the two that our our souls and, and deep down deep down I think this is what our struggle with inner self is our our, our struggle with our soul, the soul of who we are, the all-encompassing feature of our what's going on inside of us, what's going on outside of us. Those are the things in which we struggle. And so our soul is what matters. So spiritually, over and over and over, when we talk about being dead and buried in our uh, trespasses, like being buried, it's been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live but it's Christ who lives in me. It's our soul that we're talking about that's being raised from the dead. It's our soul that's being regenerated and given new life. And when our soul is completely surrendered to Christ, we accept the terms in which he gave us. When our soul is surrendered to Christ, we accept our, our body. We see its value and its worth. When we see God and the soul that he's given us, the body he's put it in, we, we, should, we should vow to take care of the body in which he's given us. We'll talk about that. But that, that we're a temple, we're a, a tent, um, that, that, we're, that our bodies are ho hosting our soul, that those two things belong to one another. We're not like hermit crabs. We don't just get to like be in, in one shell and decide we want to leave it because we outgrown it and move to another shell. The two things grow together. They're together, they're focused, but we're not limited to just our body. That after death, when, when this body turns back to dust, turns back to ashes, my soul will still live. Therefore, guard your soul. Live with the Lord. Well, my last big idea is simply this. We should live to glorify God with our body and our soul. 
that we cannot separate the two things and that we must live a life that seeks to glorify God, that submits ourselves to his word. We should see our bodies as a temple. We shouldn't see them. We, we should see, uh, yes, their brokenness. Yes, we should, 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 should see the fallenness of our humankind. But at the same time, we should repent and we should run that body and soul would be holy submitted to the Lord. This is the good news of the gospel. Is that we don't have to fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. That's the good news that uh, we, we we shouldn't we don't have to fear man. We don't have to fear the things of man. The good news of the gospel is that there's only one to fear. And that is but God himself. The God that we ought to fear, the God who can kill both body and soul, sent his son Jesus in human form, in the same image in which we have to live a life, to live a a life that was perfect and and, and right and and good. He was righteous as no other was righteous. He knew no sin, and yet he died on the cross took on our sin and our shame to bring our souls and our bodies to him, to save us. And so it's not just that he can kill our body and soul, that he can save our body and soul. The good news of the gospel is that while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. That we were alone in our sorrow and dead in our sin. Death was arrested. Christ could come in. He he made a way. His mercy knows no end. His grace is sufficient for us, and he calls us unto himself. So today I tell you, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, your soul, that God raised his son from the dead, and you will be saved. Seek to live a life that glorifies God with our body and our soul. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for your word. And this strange world that we live in, the strange times that we live in, where we thank you that your word brings clarity, it brings hope, it brings truth. That it shows us what's right and true, it shows us what's evil and what's good. It helps us to, to see the lies that we believed and helps us to re- repent of those lies. Lord, it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. And so, Lord, in your sovereign, with your sovereign kind hand and love for us, Lord, let us see the lies that we've believed about how we're made in your image and how it affects us. And Lord, uh, let us live holy for you, both body and soul. Lord, I pray that if there's someone in the room who who doesn't know you, who's rejected you, Lord, that you would save their soul, that you would open their eyes, the eyes of the heart, the eyes of the inner inner self, the eyes of the soul, and that they would run to you for salvation today. Father, we love you, and we praise you, and we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.